Perfect. Hey, while I give you a pitch about the Global Youth and News Media Prize, I'd like to invite our panel to just come up and, and take your seats. The Glo you can win a Global Youth and News Media Prize if you are doing news or literacy or media literacy by a news organization or if you're an NGO that supports a news organization. This prize started last year. We gave an honorary prize to the Guardian jointly with the uh, student journalist from Parkland High School. You know, remember the terrible shooting there. Uh, they jointly covered the March for Our Lives demonstration in Washington. And what the Guardian did, which very few news organizations are ready to do, they turned over the live coverage to those students because those students knew that the people and the topic better than any of their reporters possibly could. This year there are three categories. We've had the Planet Award, we will have a Journalism Award, and a News Media Literacy Award. Uh, the, we'll know the winners soon. We've had the kind support from the Google News Initiative, from the European Journalism Center, and from News Decoders. Those people could not be involved in the judging of anything they supported. And the winner is going to go and talk in front of an audience that's not converted to the wonderfulness of me news. Me I can't, it's late in the day. Media literacy. They're going to speak to news executives at something called News Exchange in Paris. So the goal of this is to find the good practice of news media that are listening to young people, that are helping young people, supporting young people, and spread the word to the public, which doesn't necessarily know about this, and also to other news organizations to get them to say, that's not that hard, let's start it. So as uh, we learned, we had the pleasure of standing almost the last people between you and your drink at the end of the So we're going to try to make this uh, a roundup of what you've heard all day long. There's been great stuff about measurement all day long. And we're just going to try to expand on that and get as quickly as possible to you for last questions and last wisdom you know about measurement. So let's get started. We're going to start with, we asked each of our panelists to give us two minutes on what are you doing to improve media literacy measurement efforts, the thing they really want you to take home. So we'll get started uh, with our first person, who is Emily Evans. She's chief, you know her from uh, an earlier discussion. She's chief executive of the Economist Foundation, which works with mainly nine to 11 year olds, and they complined the journal. 14 year olds. 14 year olds, nine to 14. They combine the uh, journalist experience of the economist with the experience that the teachers have. And the goal is to inspire discussion about news in the classroom through a journalistic lens. So Emily, you have two minutes. <laughs> so. Knowledge is crucial, we've talked about that today, but news literacy skills are harder to measure. So we do talk to young people about the media and teach them about current affairs, but like all of you, we want them to have the critical thinking skills to assess whether an argument is sound and the communication skills to test out arguments through dialogue and to be able to speak up about the news. Um, and those skills aren't new. They are age-old skills like reasoning. So we can look to tried and tested ways to measure impact in these skills. But it takes additional knowledge and additional confidence to apply those skills to the news. So we need to be looking for whether people are developing critical thinking skills and communication skills and whether they're applying them to the news and to current affairs. And to measure skills, we need to look for whether people are making progress over time. That is key. Um, skills build gradually. We can't expect to, for example, make an expert musician in a one-off music lesson. So as we've said all day, it, it has to be about knowing a student's starting point and then looking for how they're improving over a period of time. We have been measuring our impact in skills progress for uh, four years or so, and we've now developed a framework that reflects some of the things that we think are important. So number one, define very specifically what success looks like. So in hours, it shows 
what we think a news literate young person must know and be able to do. Two, define what it looks like for a person to progress. So this describes what it looks like, indicators of ability to assess from beginner all the way through to expert. And three, ideally measure not just progress there, but whether people are getting to where they need to get to or whether they're still behind. So this shows, it maps ability levels against where young people are supposed to get to at school. Four, compare progress to a control group, obviously if you can. So this allows us, for example, to say that young people that we work with make 136% more progress than control group students in reasoning ability. And five, it has to be usable. It has to be usable for teachers. It has to be usable for students and it has to be adaptable. So this is supposed to be something that we can use for our programs, but also that anybody could use with any news literacy initiative. So it's free. If you want to use it and you think it's helpful, then please do. So lots to say about impact <laughs> measurement, but, um, but those are the things that we think are, are helpful to know. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to move to the European level with Paolo Silo, who is founder and secretary general of EAVI, which has been doing research, lobbying, and programming in media literacy for 14 years. And he has a kind of a different take on things. As a yeah, hello to everyone. Uh, the, uh, uh, these are some of the studies that we did on behalf of the European Commission. Uh, and uh, yeah, indeed, we organize conferences, uh, by the way, as well as uh, other activities. We do a lot of lobbying. Uh, we, we have a next conference is on the 13th of November on Media Liters in Brussels, uh, looking for sponsors, uh, by the way. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have, uh, we, we got um, quite far, especially in, in policy that uh, now is, uh, is included in, uh, in European legislation. And uh, when was the time to congratulate ourselves? Uh, we, we found instead that, that we were a bit unhappy. And the reason is uh, that uh, we found uh, that one, we are preaching the converted, we are talking to ourselves. Uh, is, uh, uh, and then uh, we found that uh, media literacy is a concept that is becoming more and more uh, confusing. Europe, uh, as it has, I uh, think, is uh, becoming less media literate uh, and, uh, and, not, uh, and not more uh, Europe and the world. The next, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, thing that I want to, to mention uh, is, uh, thank you, is uh, uh, a bit more slippery concept, uh, but I thought that is, uh, uh, and, uh, that, uh, that it, it is important uh, uh, for us, uh, this uh, new approach. At the end of the day, the common denominator of uh, most of the things uh, that we have heard, uh, and congratulations for the many great initiatives that we have heard uh, uh, this afternoon uh, and, and today, is uh, the relationship in between uh, media users and, uh, and the media. And, uh, we think that we are in control, but in fact, we are not. Uh, the media are in control and not necessarily the media are to be blamed uh, is another debate uh, and, uh, and I would like to have it, but uh, uh, not in, the, in this minute. Uh, what I think is uh, that uh, this uh, relationship, uh, uh, people have to, to uh, realize uh, that in fact, they still can make a choice of uh, being on Facebook or on uh, YouTube. And we know that they are not necessarily happier when they spend uh, three hours uh, on, uh, on this uh, uh, online or uh, uh, having a walk outside. And I think that uh, this uh, media literacy competence uh, that uh, for me is very, very important uh, is uh, uh, the awareness. So the, the, the capacity of observing uh, our own uh, behavior when we are online or the capacity of uh, paying attention uh, to, uh, to, to distractions, for instance. So mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, this clarity comes uh, when uh, we are uh, able to stop. Stop uh, for a moment uh, is in itself uh, a revolutionary act. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move it along to Alison Preston. She works on the national level here in the United Kingdom at Ofcom, the independent regulator of communications industries here. She's been assessing media literacy since 2004 and currently heads up the research program of the Making Sense of Media initiative. Alison? Thank you. Uh, it's very good to be here and part of this panel. 
I wanted to use this time to tell you very briefly about the two core ways we have of fulfilling our statutory duty to promote media literacy. So the first is our research programme. We've been conducting in-depth survey research since 2005 amongst adults and amongst children to understand their online use, their attitudes and their knowledge about what they're doing online. And we also carry out particular types of other research as well into online harms and news consumption. As well as the surveys, uh, we carry out qualitative research, which really puts the flesh on the bones of the statistics. And we've got two projects that track the same people um, over e each year on camera. And what those do, and there's one for adults and there's one for children, and I think what they do is remind us that there's no such thing as an average user. There's a multitude of ways of being and behaving online, and those then make an impact on people's attitudes and concerns. I think it also reminds us, and you know, a number of people have touched on this, it's that most people aren't active in their thinking about media. They're getting on with their daily lives. And I think the consequences of these points we'll uh, touch on later in this session. But the second main area that Ofcom is focused on now is the role of coordinating and collaboration. And again, those are two words that we've heard a lot of today. There's so much going on, um, as, we've, as we've heard, but there is this appetite to make sure that we bring together and coordinate such work. So we announced in the summer that we now have a panel of 11 key stakeholders uh, that help us in working through the steps needed in this sort of activity. And i um, delighted that Josie's here, who's, who's on the panel as well, and, and various others. Um, and importantly, we also announced then that we were setting up a network, which is open to all, to join people together for collaboration, sharing breakfast, best practice, all the things that we've been discussed today. And so we'd be delighted if you'd join us. And you can see the URL there, um, or you can do the, do the Google thing, and help us make a real step change in all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Last but not least is Yu Yu Young of Yu Yu Park of Korea. She has been a Harvard and MIT trained biostatistician and then she went into consulting in one of the leading business consulting firms in the world. And then she turned her attention to digital literacy. So she's developed now the Digital Intelligence DQ framework with a coalition for digital intelligence that has agreed to use it for its global standards for digital literacy skills. Now this is a a high-powered group. It includes the World Economic Forum, the OECD, and the IEEE, which is the world's largest tech association. Over to you, Yoon. Um, would you mind me standing up? Otherwise... Please do. Uh, yes, I think um, that's a great idea. Yeah, I need to stretch my <laughs> body. Um, thank you so much, Google, for inviting us. Um, we talk about measurement. I'm a statistician. I'm a number person. But when you talk about measure, you have to think about what to measure, right? So the problem right now is that digital literacy, news literacy, media literacy, we have so many different terms, and everybody have a different understanding. The first thing that we have to do in order for us to measure our progress, we need to have common language. So Coalition for Digital Intelligence is just has a one aim. We want to create the global standard, common language for digital literacy, skills, and readiness. Why they choose a digital intelligence? Because we are very simple. We look at the eight different digital life. One is a digital literacy, but we look at digital rights, digital identity, use, safety, security, emotional intelligence, and others. And we look at three levels, starting with the first, citizenship. Life skill, we need to know how to live online safely, ethically. Second, creativity. Third, competitiveness. So with this the three by eight framework, we collect all leading frameworks around the world. 
So 2019 March, we published uh, um, our first report. We look at the 25 leading frameworks and we map against the DQ framework. So the first practice we did is let's create the common language. But it is not about the standard, it's about collaboration, as everybody say. We are talking about moving target. Technology move, media move. So we need to evolve our standard always on the move. So we'd love to collaborate all of you to co-create this standard together. And yes, I'm a researcher, I'm a thinker, but more importantly, we are all doers. So that was a brain work. The second slide is my hard work. Um, I run the DQ Every Child, which is a, a global initiative to teach children about digital uh, citizenship as well as online safety. What we have done is that we created an online platform that can children learn by themselves, but after they learn, they measure accordingly. So this is an initiative. Now we've been used by around uh, 70 uh, um, children in schools around 80 countries. So um, anybody can learn about the basic digital life skills. At the same time, they get measures. As a result, we built the, uh, one of the biggest data center uh, database uh, related to 8 to 12 years old children. And as a result, we can identify the 8 to 12 years old, 56% of our children are exposed to at least one cyber risk. And I can't talk forever about this result, uh, but at the same time, this is a power of measurement. And uh, based on that, we can see that our education efficacy, about 10% increment of DQ score, which correlate with 15% of cyber risk reduction. Um, so three things, common language, common measurement, and common data bank. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask our panel just one question, but then we're going to open it up to you because this is your last shot, except for the, the general speaker panel, to talk about research, to ask about research, to make your point about research. So here's the question that we were assigned. How can we get better measuring media literacy in a meaningful way? And that means beyond just scale, scale is important, but beyond scale and assuring that the effects last longer than 10 days. So how have you been able, what would you suggest and how have you been able to do that? Let me start with you, Allison. She needs a microphone. microphone. Mm -hmm. There are a range of, you know, range of things to say on this, on this subject. And as I say, certainly I've been at Ofcom a very long time. I've been involved in our media literacy tracking work for a very long time. I think what's really, one of the things that's really important to say is that uh, for me, media literacy is about a basket of measures um, and making sure that we kind of cover the waterfront with the range of issues and activities and behaviours and opinions around media literacy. Um, because that then, and then if we can track that over time, what we, what we find is that various of those issues and areas wax and wane as, as the years go on. And it's really important to, as I say, not, I think, sort of not overly focus on a particular um, area at any given time. If at all possible, let's look at the, the range of, of, as I say, activities, behaviours, opinions, so that we can, we can really see um, the context of what's going on. I think another key thing about all of this is that, you know, as, again, as, as various people have said over the day, in some ways, let's not make this really hard either. Because what we're talking about in media literacy increasingly is what are the sorts of things and the sorts of behaviours and attitudes that we need to, that we have in the offline world as well. And so it's all about, you know, being ethical and aware and polite and curious and so on. And all those things are, you know, are part of our daily lives. And that's why I was keen to mention the qualitative research that we do and especially the tracking research that we have when we have the very you know the same individuals the same people um, and we go back to them every year and for some of our adults that we have it's only a small number about 20 or so but we've we've got 15 years of footage for some of those and the 
the value that that brings in reminding us a of what happens in your daily life and then the you know how media is just a you know a, a part of your daily living is really important and then also how things change over time with your life circumstances and your you know the, your your aging process or whatever it might be is also very salutary as well so I think one of the things about measurement, um, as I say, it's, it's about making sure that we, we are as wide as possible in what we do. We employ a range of methodologies as well. Um, and as I say, there's something about the needs to think about media and think, start with daily life and then think about how the media kind of comes in and, and how dig our digital lives are formulated uh, with that as the starting point, and I think we can do some very interesting things there as, as okay. a result. Uh, I want to pick up on that. I, I, I really agree, and I think it's really important not to isolate media literacy or news literacy or whatever we want to call it from somebody's kind of broader education and their broader life. So as I said, the, some of the skills that we're talking about here are not skills that one learns separately as part of news literacy. They're the kinds of skills that hopefully somebody is developing if they're getting a good education, that they are somebody who learns to form a strong argument and to question things and to have the confidence to challenge authority. Um, and that the kind of knowledge that I think is really important, yes, they need to have knowledge about the media and, and, and how news is created, but it's vitally important to also have knowledge of politics and economics, to have the context in which news stories um, are, are being received. So in terms of the relevance to impact measurement, I think we need to not reinvent the wheel. We need to be looking at w what are the skills that are really important for this world that is concerning us in which news literacy has become a buzzword. But, but those skills and the kind of knowledge that's important, hopefully they're out there and there, there will be ways that, are, that, that we are measuring them already. So don't reinvent the wheel, but also don't isolate it. And that's so important to having the impact we want to have as well, because we hear politicians talking about hacking news literacy onto the curriculum as if it's an extra. And that's not going to be effective. So that, and it comes to the common language point as well, that um, I think it's absolutely vital that we have a common language. Um, and part of that, I think, is about realising that we're maybe not always talking about new things here. We're talking about new things being important in new ways. Um, and and that, that's different. Um, yeah, maybe I won't ramble on. I think okay. those are the two okay. important things. Well, since you mentioned common <laughs> framework and common language, uh, you, maybe you could talk about your Singapore-UK common framework. Um, so common framework that we develop is actually looking at um, about 10 different countries and uh, 25 different framework. But assessment-wise, what we are doing currently is together with the Singapore government, Skill Future, and the City of London, we um, we are discussing with uh, uh, UNESCO and a few others uh, NGOs who has the very leading assessment. Why don't we combine together our effort together and build a common assessment, common instrument, as well as common data bank? Uh, because at the end of the day, um, assessment and data are inevitable. Um, and it is very important, once we have a common language, we need to also have a big data that measure in a consistent way. Um, so um, I'd like to invite you, if you have uh, assessment tools that you want to be part of it, uh, please come and talk to us. But related to your questions, I think, you know, like we sometimes, um, it's, it's a pitfall that technologists or statisticians often fall into. Measurement is not about actually data. Measurement is about the story. Measurement is about what we want to achieve collectively. So it is important for us to understand what do we want to achieve as a um, media literacy. But as everybody say, and previous uh, speakers also say, we are talking about the critical thinking. Right? It's not just about um, YouTube or, you know, like, the technology will evolve, media will evolve, but core part will not evolve. So how we can ensure that we can integrate this the media literacy and critical reasoning across the curriculum? 
Um, Sam mentioned about the, well, there's information overload as well as curriculum overload. It is very difficult for us to inject new items into public schools. Then how we can gel into that and at the same time we can measure this impact into very natural and coherent way. So I think it is important for us to understand what we want to achieve, how we want to integrate it into the system, how we can build the data center based on that. Paolo, some last contribution on this? Yeah, I, I, we have worked on this for, for many years in, uh, in uh, uh, and Atlanta. I, I wouldn't want to, to disillude uh, uh, the, the people, but I, some of, of our conclusions were that uh, common language, uh, yeah, would be ideal, uh, but uh, is that the, to have a common terminology, uh, talking about the skills, abilities, competencies, uh, is uh, is very complicated uh, uh, issue. Yeah, we should have it, uh, but I think that is uh, is uh, a challenging uh, uh, bit. I agree with you. Is uh, we should define uh, first what we want to 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 assess, uh, and more than to assess, I think it's more realistic to think about what we want to to evaluate or to have an indication. Uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the overall result. It does not exist and it will not exist uh, a, a optimal uh, mathematical uh, is, uh, uh, model. In, but uh, uh, especially when we come to uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, critical literacy, for instance. But whether we, we measure individual competencies, we measure uh, country levels, or we measure uh, uh, initiatives and projects. So there are three different uh, uh, things. Is uh, one of the difficulties that we found is uh, that there is a lack of uh, data or data that are homogeneous. So there are some uh, for the access and use of media, but for other aspects uh, is uh, participation and uh, so forth uh, is uh, is very difficult to, to access those data. By the way, is uh, it will be. It would be great uh, to have uh, the, the cooperation and collaboration of uh, social media, for instance, uh, to research, uh, because they do have, uh, is, uh, and, uh, and I'm saying uh, to, to Google now, obviously, an enormous amount of data about uh, media use uh, that uh, would serve uh, a lot uh, and be useful uh, to uh, researchers. <coughs> The, um, we have to remember that is, uh, I appreciate we are talking about media literacy, no one there to, to define media literacy today. And uh, this is because it's, uh, it's a concept that is in a constant uh, state of flux. Uh, it, and we have to accept it that it's going uh, to be that way. And therefore measuring it uh, is uh, really a, a, a big uh, uh, ambition. I think. But we have, don't misunderstand me, we have to work towards that. Uh, is uh, being realistic about what uh, indeed we can achieve. Well, I, I, I have a slightly different actually idea about uh, how we define the media literacy. Um, there are numbers of great literature already defined, I think including your work, um, about how we want to say the media literacy. So what we do with OECD is that each competency is consists of uh, knowledge, skills, attitude, and values. So knowledge part, easy to test. Skill part, less easier, but still managed to test. Attitude and value, that is a part that is very, very difficult to measure. So, um, and also we are now in the living in the age of AI and big data. Um, so it's, it's structured data, unstructured data. We have so many ways to actually measure. We can concretize about the measurement. I, I, I have a for, I'm a form believer for that. But as you say, I think it is not the easy task, but it is also very important to notice that there are a lot of data all scattered around the world. So academics, institution, they have some data, NGO, some data, how we can actually collaborate our effort to make it into one big database. So uh, I was a biostatistician. We had a gen bank. We had a, like, a human genome projects to collaborate this effort. Why don't we do that? So I think that is one of the things that we would love to have the conversation. Now I'd like to open up. Oh, last. Sorry, I was yeah. just going to, to add to that. I think that the, you know, the collaboration point is, is really important. I think 
added to that though, and as you say, in terms of in terms of the the challenges of measuring or kind of defining a levels of media literacy, it's I think we need to be as granular as we possibly can amongst different audience and user groups because if you're online and you're only going to Marks and Spencers to do your shopping online or something, versus if you're you know voyaging uh, widely uh, you know across all sorts of different sites you're going to have you understandably you're going to have different levels of confidence and concern and so on whereas if you if, if we amalgamate all those into a kind of single uh, measure then that I think is you know is is tricky we need to be looking at as many you know breaking our data down into the particular audience group, the particular user groups, um, the particular types of use online. And then we build a much richer picture of what's really going on and a reminder that our, you know, our ways of being online are incredibly different now. Can I make a really quick Sure, point? sure. I promise it'll be quick. Um, I think pragmatism is really important because it is really hard. I, I, as you say, it's... I think it's important to accept that it's really hard. And evidence that it's really hard is that when we looked just for frameworks to measure critical thinking and reasoning, there's no common language on that either. And that's been around for a really long time. Um, so I think it's important to admit that it's hard. And therefore, to be honest and transparent is one of the most important things that you can do in impact measurement, to not be making claims that you can't substantiate and to just be honest about why you do believe this thing or that thing about your program. And that helps with the collaboration point too if we're being honest about how we're evaluating then we can work more, more easily together okay let's open it up to you for questions and last comments about how we can do it better i know it's late we'll do it <laughs> i can't see over there on the that side in the back remember to tell us who you are and then one over here um, thank you so much, Fay Lance from the National Literacy Trust. It's a really fascinating panel. Thank you all. Um, one thing that I've noticed today is that we're talking a lot about um, participants in all of our programmes as consumers of, of news and online content. We've not talked a lot about the way that most people in the world are engaging with content, which is as active creators of content themselves. Really interested to hear from this panel whether there's any examples of best practice or kind of tools you've used to kind of assess skills or even to sort of target programmes at particular people who are, who are clearly struggling with their media literacy from the content that they're creating. I don't know if that's a very clear question. <laughs> Did you understand that? So, so best practice in supporting young people to develop news literacy as through creators creating. of content rather than as consumers of content. I mean, I can't help but do a small, very quick plug that for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Sure>. um, <laughs> so we're, one of the things that we do, we have a programme called the Burnett News Club, which um, we give teachers what they need to work with their kids in their classrooms. Um, it's blended learning, lots of people talking today about in-person and online learning combined, so the teachers have inspiring discussions with young people about current affairs, covering things from what's happening in Hong Kong to Trump's wall, um, so we look in-depth at important topics, inspire and engage. But then the young people have to um, form sound arguments and express those themselves. And we find that's a really important part of engaging them and developing their news literacy. That's really exciting and giving them a real audience is massively inspiring. So they're then able to publish their work on our platform, um, which kind of elevates what they have to say because it's an economist branded platform. So they, they publish their work, but there are two things I'd say that are important, well, from our point of view, with content creation. One, give them a real audience. <laughs> um, so, as I say, we in our case, we do that by publishing their work, um, but then make that audience engaged. So what we do is we publish their stuff, and then we are really passionate about enabling discussion between young people in different communities, including globally. So talk to me if you know schools who want to be involved with our global stuff. But getting, getting them to talk to each other across different communities so that they're publishing their content 
sharing their local experience of an issue, but they're also able to read other young people's experiences by reading their content. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's what I would say. We also oh, bring so in leaders from around the world to join the conversation, so the real audience also has authority and can do something about what they have to say. Thank you, Emily. There's Sorry, also fine. research about this. Uh, Hobbes, uh, Renee Hobbs, who some of you know, who's an excellent uh, person in this field, did some work on the PBS NewsHour student reporting labs. And she found that the production of news was really powerful in uh, increasing understanding of other people, willingness to listen to other people, and in other media literacy skills. I've not seen much else about research. We've got a lot of experience about production, but research about it. Have any of you had any uh, seen any good studies about that? That's about the best one I've seen. It's from 2016. Any other panel members? Any other research like that? So it's a great field. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not uh, not maybe. The research per se, but there are some really. She good needs stuff. a microphone. <clears throat> we're talking about research here, so let's stick to research, and we're running out of time. Uh, and we have one more person to ask Henry a question. Henry Jenkins material that supports the MacArthur Foundation curriculum, which is, um, it's built around civic participation and youth activism, but it's, it's really great. And it's, it's, it's really based on Henry Jenkins' research. Uh, okay. And there's a lot of uh, media making curriculums that stem from that. So okay. I think it's so a good starting point. We have another question, unless you want to answer this one. Yes, actually, I okay. saw the, um, the few extra research from the Australia. In the new, um, I, I, I couldn't answer because I can't get back to you, but uh, <laughs> there are a few professors working on the content creations as well as the, uh, the news leaders linked to that. So there are the research. Yeah. Great. All right, that's good to know. We had a question, a person You're waiting ready. over here. Uh, Divina from X from uh, the Sorbonne University past director of uh, CLEMI and member of the uh, uh, expert group, European expert group on fake news. I listened to all of you uh, with interest and I've liked the take that we are trying to push media and information literacy to the 21st century. But what I hear about assessment is 21st, 20th century, which is to say in a way, again, an individual way of uh, um, assessing one person for its uh, work value. And this is not what media literacy is about and hasn't been since the beginning. And sorry if I feel like an old uh, hag, uh, but um, I've been in this field for like 50 years. And what's different about media literacy and one, one of the reasons it's never entered the schools is that media literacy activists have said it's not about the traditional way of evaluating. And when you are on a project-based or a project-centered approach, having an individual assessment sort of breaks up the participation breaks up the building of distributed competences among people and among groups, breaks up the creativity approach where what you're teaching about creativity is that one person alone doesn't create. It is because you're confronting, because you're sharing, because you have this final goal of publishing and exposing your approach. And so it's all this thing about output and outcome. And granted, it's very difficult to measure but I think uh, this is where we should go if we want to do something new and if we want to move uh, our students and our people into what the so-called creative industries of today, which are based on creativity and et cetera, et cetera. So okay. uh, uh, f projecting them back into uh, the traditional way of assessing individual breakdown, critical skills, blah, blah, to me uh, is not negative, um, don't get me wrong, um, but to me, it's not uh, pushing us and helping media literacy help all the other literacies upgrade to 21st century uh, uh, skills. I don't know if I'm clear okay. about that. And this is where, second point, so this is one first point to you, um, uh, Yu Hyun. Um, it is about, since we are not a subject, we are never uh, assessed for ourselves. It's done in the English language, it's done in the math studies, it's done in the history, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's always very difficult for us to be assessed when we are transversal. So we fall back on what? What we've done today, all of us, which is to say best practices. Now, who says best practice? 
We are running out of time. Yes, but, but best practices. So I'm sending mm -hmm. you to the work of the Council of Europe where we have been trying to assess and, and try to establish a framework to assess good practices because good practices are often assessed by the people who do them. It's the last thing you do when you have these projects. All of us are falling short of time to assess good practices. So we say they work because we said we trained 50 students and we've trained them so it works. So but we're really, speaking of we're running out of time. We're going to base media literacy <laughs> on good practices. We'd better assess good practices about distributed competences. Sorry for being long, That's but okay. uh, this is key. You have been nodding your head. You have 38 seconds to respond. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's talk later at the cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem with this topic, that any, uh, and any one of these people up here could could speak for 40 minutes on it, as well as many of you. So there's probably a whole day to do this. One last thing from me, if you have questions about the Global Youth and News Media Prize, you can ask myself or Joe Weir, where are you, Joe, who is the other director of this? And one final point, sometimes the naked eye will do with media literacy. Uh, Climi in France has been in charge of media literacy. There, our speaker just there was in charge of it for many years. And when the journalists were, when the satirical cartoonists were killed, uh, teenagers took to the streets. And you could ask any one of those teenagers why they were in the streets. And they could give you a very eloquent description of the importance of freedom of expression and you should not be killing people who express it. So thank you all. And I turn it over to our, our leaders. Thank you. Mm -hmm.